Everybody, welcome back to my channel. Today, I am gonna recap some Facts of Life episodes. I've been doing a deep dive into that. As you know, I love 80s nostalgia, and I hope some of you at least remember Facts of Life. It is definitely where I learned a lot of my life lessons, and even continue to learn life lessons upon rewatch. Um, and over the years, I've seen some of the characters, and I'm not just talking George Clooney, but I've seen some of the characters pop up in other things. My favorite was Mrs. Garrett in an episode of Pretty Little Liars. Um, so let's get started. So the first episode, the first episode I'm talking about is, um, I love a good Blair episode. And this is an episode where a sorority has their eye on her. And um, I'm gonna have to look up the actress because I've seen her in so many things. But Blair's trying to impress her to get into this sorority. And, um, the way that Blair does it is by promising that Mrs. Garrett can do some catering, which starts out fine until uh, Mrs. Garrett starts making Mexican food, which apparently was like so last month. And what's in style now is Chinese food. I love in this show how often Blair talks about like trends and stuff like that and how they were so last year or so last month and stuff like that. And it's the most random thing. like spiked heels were so last year according to Blair and now Mexican food um so okay so Blair wants to get into the stupid Gamma Gamma sorority um and because of the whole Mexican food debacle Mrs. Garrett pulls out and the girls decide to make Chinese food on their own using this like celebrity cookbook which includes David Bowie's wonton recipe they make and there's like Mr. T's fried rice and stuff like that. Um, I don't even think I found these jokes funny in the 80s, but um, you know, God bless you, Facts of Life. I, I make fun of it, but I, I love it so much. And I love Mrs. Garrett's wisdom every episode. It's so amazing. So the Chinese food turns out to be insanely horrible, of course. And the way that they get out of it is Mrs. Garrett was like, after whatever her name is, Mitzi, Bootsy, whatever, 80s sorority garbage name, um, she's complaining that the food is Barfarama. And Mrs. Garrett's like, that's funny because when I catered Calvin Klein the same food, he loved it. And then that's enough for the Gamma Gamma girls to find the food amazing. So fantastic episode. There's two episodes where Joe, who they've made fun of this on Chelsea lately, years ago, like, Joe is like a lesbian and it's so good. Um, dates rich guys. One guy is a rapist and the other guy actually loves her for who she is. So, um, I mean, there's so many societal issues in the facts of life and we get to see them played out through Joe and Blair and the intermingling of Blair society and stuff like that. And Blair always like freaks out when somebody from her rich society wants to get to know Joe from the Bronx. Um, so this is the episode with the nice rich boyfriend who is like a million miles tall and him and Joe have like a really cute thing going on. And um, Joe has no idea he's rich. He invites her out to dinner with his parents and Blair catches word of this and Blair knows who his parents are and they're, they're um, I, what was it? An ambassador or something? Like it was like a crazy high up position and there's a makeover on Joe which I always love Joe makeovers because they're so 80s and they're so out of control and this dress and this hair are absolutely out of control and Natalie and Tootie like can't stop staring at Joe and calling her beautiful which I have to say like I'm gonna take Joe um when she's got like light kind of like grayish taupe makeup in her everyday um try try ponytail where she's got like two ponytails and then she joins it at the bottom with a third ponytail that's actually my favorite joe um but i can't resist a good joe makeover so blair gives her this makeover which is amazing and then she goes to the dinner date and is like full force bronx it's a whole thing amazing episode the next episode is a classic and maybe Definitely one of my favorites. Um, this is the episode with marijuana in it. Uh, and it is a cautionary tale, mind you. So it starts off with like Blair wanting to get into this group called the group, by the way. And she, it's like all secretive and like 
another girl. This was the first season of Facts of Life when they had like all the girls in the dorm. Um, most of them were cut. And one of those girls includes Molly Ringwald, who is wearing this dazzling number here, which is like some sort of overall bow ensemble. And um, yeah, so one of the other girls wants to get into the group and Blair is like, but you gotta be cool to get in the group. And Blair pulls out this like lipstick case with a joint in it, which is like, there's no words. Um, it's weird though, cause it's like so out of character for Blair who is like very, very, very straight laced. And now she's like just walking around Eastland with a joint. Anyways, so later they go to the group's like dorm room or whatever. Um, Helen Hunt is there, obviously, and they're already high, and, um, yeah, it's just what you think drugs would be. There's, like, one girl almost passed out, everybody's giggling, it's, like, sort of out of control, and Blair is, like, not impressed with this. So she went from, like, dying to get into this group and carrying around this, like, lipstick joint to all of a sudden being, like, actually, this isn't a good idea because, like, I don't want to become dumb. Which is fine, I guess that's how decisions make. But then Sue Ellen, who is like scandalized by weed, all of a sudden wants to smoke a joint. So it's like this super weird reverse uh, that happens in the matter of like 30 seconds. And then like Tootie busts in because um, she's like so curious about the group and she finds out where they are. And there's like bongs and roaches all over the place, which is like not good for Tootie and her roller skates at 12 or however old she is. Um, Blair doesn't know what a roach is. She actually thinks there's like roaches in the dorm room. So there's like super fun, naive humor like that in it. And then um, they try to pass it off to Tootie that the bongs are just for uh, storing jelly beans. And she totally buys it. Um, as you would, I guess, when you're 12 and wear roller skates. So Sue Ellen also has to write a 20 page paper on Moby Dick that night. It's due the next day. So maybe this isn't your best night to start smoking pot with Helen Hunt, just saying. And the next morning she comes downstairs and she's like, oh my God, Mrs. Garrett, I wrote my 20 page paper on Moby Dick. Every, it's like the, my best work. You should be so proud of me. And Mrs. Garrett proceeds to read it, and it's literally, like, she writes one sentence on each page, and it's stuff like, um, Moby Dick was a marshmallow sundae with ice cream. And Mrs. Garrett's like, wow. And that is what they're saying pot does, is that you would write that and think it's good. Um, okay, sure. Uh, if that's how it is, yeah, then um, that's really scary and I can see why Blair would not want to smoke pot. They almost get caught by the Dean because he's suspicious of Blair's like weird empty lipstick case. Uh, but Blair's like, you know, I don't smoke weed, I get high on myself and then proceeds to look at herself in a mirror, which is like a great life hack. And like... <sighs> At the end, they're all like, I would never mess up my lives. Because, like, the the other girls, Helen Hunt and stuff like that, got expelled. So, the moral of this story is that if you smoke pot, you're ruining your life. And you're writing, like, these bizarre papers on Moby Dick. That's the lesson. So, phew, everybody learns this lesson. And then they have this weird jelly bean orgy at the end of it because 2D had bought some bongs with Natalie to like give out and gave one to Mrs. Garrett who's like totally shocked and 2D had also bought a bag of jelly beans to fill the bongs up with because that's what you do with bongs and instead at the end obviously they got rid of the bongs they still have the jelly beans and they have this super weird jelly bean orgy to close that episode so amazing the next episode is when joe actually arrives at eastland and she's like the motorcycle riding badass from the bronx and immediately gets the girls into trouble by hot wiring the eastland van and driving to the local bar the chuggalug which looks like 
uh, like the tiniest, most garbage place you've ever been to. There's like five people in it, but for them, it's like a super duper adventure where they can meet men. And keep in mind, I think they're 16 at this point and they get in the bar with their fake ID because of course Joe got some in the Bronx. And then Tootie and Natalie are like standing outside, like peering into the chug -lug. Um They immediately sit down and this guy who looks 40, five, 45 maybe, 38 minimum, starts hitting on them. And they think he's like so hot. And like, I'm sorry, but like at 16, I certainly did not uh, want to talk to dudes like that. I would just be a normal 16 year old at parties with you know, 15 to 18 year olds or whatever. So this was just like outside of my realm of comprehension, but it turns out the guy's a cop and they just handle it badly. And then Tootie pours beer on him and stuff like that. It's out of control because like, I also don't think that a lot of cops are going to go undercover to bust teenage drinking. I don't think that's a thing. I feel like when I was younger, it was more, that the actual bar would enforce that. It wasn't a, an undercover cop at a bar meant for like, you know, I don't even know how to describe these bars. I, I actually worked at a bar like that. It's the type of bar that just 10 people go maximum. And it's like the most sad, depressing place. And like, you can get like chicken chip specials and like the, every table is like sticky with beer it's that kind of bar so i don't think like a undercover cop would waste his time doing that let alone go to that type of bar wouldn't he go somewhere where there's like actual people i don't know so it was so weird in the style that facts of life can only do which i love and appreciate every second of it the next one is like actually an episode that touches me um because i do like that even though Joe has a really tough Bronx exterior it's because it's covering up all the hurt that she's gone through and she's actually super vulnerable inside and so she goes on a date with a rich guy who is like so gross with his like blonde white blonde eyebrows and of course he's like Joe's friend and um, once again we have a Joe makeover and she's wearing this outfit which looks like a costume for a medieval renaissance fair i don't know i don't totally get it i don't remember stuff like this being around in the 80s but this is this is like 1980 like or whatever it's really early so i mean i guess i missed out on that whole amazing trends in fashion and joe feels like princess and she's going to the cotillion cotillion um in blair's world blair is not invited so you know we feel like joe might have the upper hand but it turns out that this guy basically sexually assaults Joe. And it's because she's from the wrong side of the tracks. And then her and Blair have a heart to heart. And Blair is like, you know, it's not just, you know, you because you're from the other side, wrong side of the track. She's like, I own the tracks and guys still treat me like this. So this one struck a, a nerve in me because I, I felt so bad for Joe. She's trying to make something better of her life. And she is an amazing person and this guy just absolutely disrespects her and treats her like she's a piece of garbage. Oh, it's just, oh, it's so sad. I just hate to see Joe get so excited for this thing and then to be treated like that. Oof, it's a, it's a dark one. It's one of the darker Who's the Boss episodes, or Who's the Boss, wow, Facts of Life episodes. Uh, um. The next one is our favorite, because Cousin Jerry uh, enters into this one. And at first, we think Blair is, like, super embarrassed of her because she has cerebral palsy. This is another thing that Chelsea lately, like, did a little spoof of. Um, and Jerry has cerebral palsy. She's a comedian, which, they, which is awesome that they're, you know, using a feminine pronunciation of it, but they're just hitting it way too hard. Okay, yeah, so Chelsea Lately, sorry, let me just, okay, yes, Chelsea Lately makes fun of sort of this, this Cousin Jerry character a little bit, too. Um, I am definitely not making fun of her because she has cerebral palsy at all. I am making fun of this episode because the joke's in it, because she's a comedian, are 
so bad. Um, I just, like, I can't even. They're amazing. I, I didn't even write them all down because there was too many of them. Like, she makes jokes about, like, um, like as you can see in this t-shirt, this, uh, like, drunk joke and cerebral palsy, which is, like, hilarious. And then she, t she like, to, you know, diffuse some of the tension because people can't hand, like, they just are, like, awkward around, like, a handicap. Um, says that when I'm drunk, I actually walk straight. And then she does this set at um, Blair's, like, Blair wins an award for fine arts. But for some reason, it's a formal dinner with a banner. And Cousin Jerry is telling some jokes. Well, I went to a handicap school and our baseball team was walkers versus wheelchairs. And in order to score a home run, I just locked the wheelchair. Like, it's like so bad, but everybody in the audience is dying. And the whole episode, we, we thought Blair was like um, embarrassed by Cousin Jerry, but it turns out that Blair is just like jealous because Eastland is like her jam and she, doesn't want like the attention kind of I don't know it's a whole thing anyways it doesn't matter but she decides to make up with Jerry by going on stage while Jerry's doing her set and make up with her in front of everybody and like they do this routine like that includes singing tea for two and then telling like these like little, like terrible jokes in between the, the little song bits um what is that like a vaudeville style I'd have to look it up but you You've definitely seen it, like a Laurel and Hardy kind of hammy style. And of course, everybody finds that hilarious. I don't know. It's just like, oh, so good. The jokes are just so, so good in this. Um, the next episode is When They Steal. And like, this is bananas because they're already on probation for hot wiring the van, going to the chuggalo, getting busted by a cop uh, for underage drinking, and then the van being like smashed. So they're already like in you know like in a tight situation and they decide joe decides to like steal a hawaiian shirt for mrs garrett um because she feels a little bit insecure that blair's gift is gonna be something that upstages her like who cares like joe has not cared about any of this before and like don't even bother because Joe got Mrs. Garrett a Gucci purse. I like lost it when I saw, oh, so good. I would love to have a Gucci purse from the early eighties. That's amazing. Um, so yeah, they steal this like horrible Hawaiian shirt um, because out of nowhere, they know that Mrs. Garrett's deepest desire is to have like a terrible Hawaiian shirt. They go to, like, what I think is supposed to be, like, a high-end women's clothing store. And um, the sale was supposed to be $15.99 and because, or $15, whatever. And that's what they had to pay with. And the sales girl is being, like, super snobby to them. It says the sale's not on. For some reason, that, like, insults Blair or insults Joe when she thinks that, like, she's entitled to steal from that store, which is, like, so weird. We're, being somebody who works in retail, um, I have to tell people all the time, like, a sale is over. So it's, like, s so strange, this act of rebellion. And um, they're looking at the Hawaiian shirts, and, like, they're 30 and $40, which is, like, I don't know if that was, like, Holt Renfrew prices to them. Because this store looks like something that would be open in a Galleria. And I mean, actually 40 bucks even today will get you like an okay shirt. It's, it's, it does sound kind of high at the time, but they're acting as if they are at like Saks Fifth Avenue or like in the Prada store. I don't know. It's just, it's like so fascinating. Um, yeah. So this is a shirt. Enjoy. The last episode I'm just going to quickly talk about is, um, when we get to finally meet Jill's boyfriend, Eddie, who's a sailor. And this episode is enjoyable just because he's like wearing his sailor uniform the entire episode. And he is like literally probably the only good looking guy we see for many seasons, despite the girls ooing and aahing over the grossest men. Um, he's actually good looking. He wants to marry Joe, even though they're 16 and he makes $500 a month in the Navy. And that's gonna do them. Um, 
But I kind of include this one because once again, we get to see Blair work her magic on Joe's style when she gives Joe a peignoir that is 100% silk for their wedding night and it is so gross. And of course, Eddie is like, wow, you look so beautiful, Joe. And he just keeps saying, you look so classy, you look so classy. But this is also like where we realize that Joe is no longer a girl from the Bronx. And that because she can pull off a peignoir and make adult decisions like not marrying at 16, we realize that she is a classy lady. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that as much as I enjoyed rewatching the facts of life. And um, have a great day, guys. Love and peace. And should Fatty sleeping. Let's wake her up. Let's wake her up. Okay.